Martin, because every good discussion must start out as a horribly irrelevant diatribe, I've been looking for a hat. Like and in, in real life, you want a hat? In, yes. For a hat? Because I went for a walk yeah, today and didn't have one. today is the first, I would say, like legitimately cold day, at least since the first legitimately cold podcasting day. Maybe not day ever, but it is the first yeah. of December, and yeah. I just realized that... It's your that first chance to go on a diatribe about hats. I have, and I have somehow lost all my hats. So, uh, I know you have a cool hat. I do. I have this pretty dope hand-knitted, or I don't really know the differences between knitting and other things, but this hand-knitted Pokemon hat that you got me, it's like a Pokeball. Oh, wait, I got you that, didn't I? Yeah, you got me that for, like, my birthday or something. That's right. It's what happens if I type cool. cool hat into Amazon? See, that's what I was thinking. Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay, so the like, first... Is that like Cthulhu or something? The first thing that comes up way. is a Viking beard hat. Oh, that's what And I think that's... I think that's it. They have a knight helmet one. They have a beard one. I mean, the Viking beard. I'm going to say this does look like Cthulhu. It really especially does. Especially the green one. Yeah, it totally that's does. Like, the red one looks Cthulhu like uh, that Futurama guy, Zoidberg. <laughs> yeah it does that's pretty great the orange one does too how did you find something so cool so fast i just typed cool hat into amazon, amazon i guess their recommendations search. are on point but i was gonna say you know you have this pokeball hat yeah and it just made me think like if i get a normal hat i'm not gonna be as cool as martin no one's gonna like so, you if you have a normal hat Ooh, i could get one of those ashankas i don't even know what that means it's one of those like russian fur hats oh that's cool yeah that's cool. I think some of our friends have used those in the past. Here we go. This one looks super warm. Anyway, all right. I, I think the Viking beard hat, that might be the one. Yeah. Has to be the one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the, <laughs> welcome back to the College of Bogey podcast, friends. Uh, we've got some more questions to answer from some some interesting people, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't tell you who these questions came nope. from, Martin, but no actually. Longer, no longer villains and heroes and things. It's not, you know, and I'm very surprised that I didn't know that time travel existed, but apparently there is a medium for people who have been long dead to send us messages because we've received three questions from famous philosophers. Really? Throughout famous history. Philosophers. Yeah. Ooh. It's, it's pretty cool. But before we dig into their very important questions, I want to let people know that if you got questions about student life, about studying, about how to become more productive or your career, or basically anything that pops into mind that you think we would be qualified to answer, if anything, you can ask us in our community, which is collegeinfogeek.com slash community. That'll port you over to our subreddit. And that is the best place to ask questions because other people can also answer them for you, which is kind of a win-win. Uh, you can also tweet me, Tom Frankly, if you have a short question and you just don't like Reddit for some reason, because you're just like, I don't know, yeah. a Reddit hater. Yeah, fair enough. There are a lot of Reddit, Reddit haters out there, actually. <laughs> and hey, that's okay. It happens. But anyway, let's jump right into it, because we tried for 30 minutes last time. We failed, but maybe we can get it this time. <laughs> we shall see <laughs> what our destiny holds. There's no such thing as free will. So yeah. Just do what we can. So the first question this week, and I don't even know if I feel worthy of trying to give this person advice, but Confucius. Confucius. Confucius asked us. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. His burning question is, what kind of useful specific skills can I build to help myself be more flexible in the job market <laughs> if I can't quite get the job I want? <laughs> <laughs> or the job market takes turn for the oh, worst. Oh, no. It's Confucius at Burger King. Uh, do. Yeah, I would recommend getting really good at picking rice and and writing philosophical treatises. Yeah. Those are always in demand. Yeah. You know, I was going to say this because I think this is a question that it's going to get a different answer depending on the spirit of the times if we take it literally. Yeah. I mean, like the first thing that popped into my mind, which is not necessarily what I would say, but it's what a lot of people would tell you is you got to learn how to code, man. Everyone should learn how to code. But a hundred years ago, they would say, well, the clear skill is to be able to hook up a plow to an ox or, I don't know, to know how to drive a horse carriage or something. Yeah, certainly not coding. That's I don't think it's coding, yeah. So I was thinking more deeply about this, and this is something that I did think about a lot when I was in college because I got into college, as you did as well, right after the 2008 stock market exchange. And I don't know if that did anything to your 
mental state I just about your future it would work out did you yeah it did it, look at that i mean it I did right. technically it did but i was i was kind of the opposite like there was there was this thing in the back of my brain was like okay it's probably going to work out i know that most market dips have a you know kind of a bounce back eventually but there were all these articles out there about all the 2008 and 2009 college graduates are not going to be able to get a job they're all screwed what do you do and I was going into college, so you know, half of my brain was like, okay, I've got four years, it'll probably be fine when I get out, but what if it isn't? And in any case, how do I set myself apart and figure out how to you know, stand out from everyone in case the job market's bad, like this person's asking? Or even if it's not, and it just happens to be like a really competitive thing I'm going for. So with that in mind, I have always thought that the, the skill, quote unquote, that is most important to cultivate in order to be flexible in the job market is simply the skill of networking. Yeah. Just being able to get yourself out there, make connections that other people wouldn't make. And those are going to lead to job opportunities. I mean, your skills are only half the equation. You also have to be able to be findable. You have to have people who know you're out there and who can actually use what you have to offer. So whatever you can do to become a better networker, which I mean, it's mainly practice going to events or going to informational interviews, doing job shadows, um, even doing like online networking, practice that kind of stuff. It's not only going to help you become a better skilled networker, but it's also going to build your network in a very objective sense. So yeah, one of those areas where practice actually has results that are beyond just the practice, because I mean, you're, like you don't you don't go into a practice networking session and then at the end the person's like, "All right, thanks for practicing on me. I no longer know you." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never talk to me again. No, like you probably are friends with that person unless you, I don't know, threw up on them or something. Yeah, and friends help friends. And if you got the right network, you could even theoretically end up in a job where you don't technically have the on paper qualifications and they're just like, "I know you. It's hard times right now." And we need somebody with a simple skill I can teach you pretty quickly. You might end up with a job there, even though it wasn't even close to what you do. Yeah. Like, the human connection is the way we get jobs. Actually, didn't you say that when you got hired at the web development place full-time after college, like, you technically didn't have all the skills they needed? Yes. So, yes. really, that was In just fact, kind of a, I was a networking that they thing. they didn't prefer to hire people just out of college. Mm-hmm. But, thanks to the Love Letter site, which we've talked about before... Mm -hmm. And thanks to my ability to communicate my way through an interview and convince them, I read like eight books in preparation for the, for the position. Wait, really? Yeah. He was like, here are some books I recommend to get your skills up to where oh, you'd like to start. And I that's was like, right. okay, I'm going to read this book and I'm going to read, he told me to read a couple from this series. I'm going to read all of them just, just to overkill it and show that I really care about this position. And those kind of things I think are more important because- I stand out as the person who tried really hard, whereas mm -hmm. somebody who already had the skills, they didn't stand out for having the skills. They already had them. Yeah, that makes sense. Were those books all coding books? Yes. Uh, there's a smashing WordPress one mm -hmm. that I'll, I'll link to maybe, but I don't remember the full title. And then a bunch from the A Book Apart series. That's right. Okay. I wasn't sure yeah. if you were talking about like career books or, no. or coding specific books. No, like he was like, your code... You, you don't code quite to the level we'd like you to start at, mm -hmm. but we like you because of all this other stuff, the communication, the interview, the love letter site, the confidence, the commitment, and learn the skills so that you can do this for us. And that, yeah. that's something I wouldn't have been able to do had I not had the networking beforehand. Mm -hmm. A lot of my jobs came from networking as well. There were a couple where I applied because of a job board posting or something, but uh, my big internship that came from networking. I oh, did you not, not even see, interview. I did. Yeah, I didn't even interview. Yeah, you didn't so even the, have to have an interview. The way that came about was, I was browsing Twitter actually during one of my classes in freshman year because I wasn't being a good student. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. And I saw that this company, Principal Financial, was going to put on this freshman leadership seminar. It was going to be a two day event, and I applied for it. And then I got accepted, so I had to drive down, check into a hotel, and then I went and met lots of other students from around Iowa. And then we went through all these sessions on how to dress professionally and how to network and interview. And then we got paired up with mentors. And I ended up getting paired up with the vice president of all the IT infrastructure of the entire company, which is really cool. And 
We had a really good conversation. We ended up staying in touch and meeting a couple of times over the summer. And because I knew him, and because I also made sure to get to every single career fair and career fair related event and talk to their recruiters as well, I just had like connections with a bunch of people in the company to the point where they called me up during the internship hiring season and they said, hey, you've been around for the entire summer. We don't feel the need to interview you. You can just have an internship if you want. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, Sweet. And then uh, also for the web development job that I had on campus, I got that because I was doing a extra credit project for my MIS class where I had to build a website. And for some reason, I think I needed to get server space on the university web servers that I think I needed like some, oh, I, I need a PHP. That's what it was. So they didn't let you have PHP on your normal student web locker or whatever. And I needed a special one. Yeah. So I had to go meet the guy who ran campus web development and had a chat with him, ended up talking about how I'd been designing websites in college or in high school and a little bit in college. And then he was like, well, we're hiring soon. Do you want to apply for a job? Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think networking is is probably the big one there. I, I can't really speak to other specific skills because everything's going to change with the times, but I do want to mention something that I read in Deep Work recently. So Deep Work is the latest book by Cal Newport, and it argues about why it's so important to build the skill of being able to concentrate deeply on your work and not be distracted, be multitasking, jumping back and forth between things. I just finished reading it over Thanksgiving. fan freaking tastic book. Like it, it may very well go on the top of my recommended reading list Ooh. on the website. Like it, it might, yeah, it might be the top one because I'm reading through it. And uh, I was just realizing even in college, but even, you know, especially now, I've been working in such a distracted way that it's been killing my ability to deeply get into my writing and to editing into a lot of things. And I think it's a huge problem for students as well. And I mean, it's not just me making this up. I get emails about, I can't focus. I'm distracted. I can't convince myself to work every single day. It's the number one thing I get emailed about. So it's probably going to go to the top, but in his argument, for why deep work is so important. He identifies the three groups of people that are going to basically own the future with our new economy and with how technology is progressing. So he identifies the, uh, the high skilled workers. So people like he identifies Nate Silver, who's the guy who runs 538, the guy who basically pioneered using Bayesian statistical modeling for predicting ele elections, you know, as somebody who is going to own the economy because they can work with information systems and machines in a super complex way. And then people like superstars, like superstar programmers, people who are kind of also like this. Uh, and then the owners. So everyone who owns all the servers, who owns all the data and who has tons of money to do like venture capital stuff. So going from that, he has this section called how to become a winner in the new economy. And right out of the way, he kind of says like, well, if you're a college student or your recent grad or whatever, you're probably not the owner. And I can't just tell you, go be a VC or go own Amazon. Yeah. So it breaks down the two specific skills. Number one, the ability to quickly master hard things. So can you learn, can you adapt, and can you do it at speed? And number two, the ability to produce at an elite level in terms of both quality and speed. So can you make things that are very good and can you do it quickly? So whatever it is you're doing, whether it be coding or whether it be fashion design or writing or being a public speaker or whatever, figure out how you can learn how to learn essentially. And what he argues in deep work is that you do that by cultivating a habit of doing deep work and not being distracted. And number two, figure out how you can actually take your skills and your knowledge and apply that to whatever it is you're doing so that you produce things of value and you can get them out quickly. And that's what I got for Confucius. Cool. Confucius say, man who stands on toilet, get high on pot. Is that, yeah. <laughs> wow. Deep. <laughs> I couldn't resist it. <laughs> anyway. All right. Who's the next one? Second question comes from German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Crazy. The man had an amazing mustache. I mean, look at this. Look at this guy. It is an amazing look at this mustache. mustache. I've I've seen him enough on I've never existential even... comics to know. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's a good comic. I forgot yeah. about that. That's like my favorite web comic right now. Is it? Yeah. Even more than SMBC? Well, it's only every Monday, but I like it more consistently because there are fewer and yeah, you know, there SMBC's great. It's right up there. It's my second favorite. 
but occasionally I'm like, that's not my genre of joke. But sometimes oh, okay. it gets me with some linguistic specific stuff and it's really good. Yeah. But it's it's more varied. The philosophy one's always about philosophy, so I basically always like it. Do you always read existential comics? Yeah. Okay. I've only read a few and from that I would say I really like it, but it never it never makes me laugh out loud like really hard. It just kind of gives me like a, a, a smart chuckle or something. Yeah. So I do like it, but I think that SNBC is a little funnier because sometimes I like legitimately laugh hard at that one. Anyway, we'll link them up in the show notes for those of you who want to distract yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like the worst thing for to link of you up. Who don't want to do any deep work. Today. If you're on a break. Yeah, actually, this is going out a few days after I published my video on taking effective breaks. So for those of you who have watched that video, you know the correct times to go read these stupid web comics yeah and the incorrect times anyway nietzsche has a very important question for us which i don't think he needs to ask because this question is what is the best way to expand my vocabulary i feel i'm a good writer but i can't write with a th without a thesaurus next to me well i'm confused i assume his vocabulary is pretty good apparently not but it you was know? all it was all an illusion yeah so. i don't know man Apparently, he wrote all these philosophical works with a giant thesaurus next to him, like Beyond Good and Evil, just thesaurus. Yeah. He wanted to write good, but it's like, oh, what's that? good, uh, great, yeah, wonderful. Beyond, oh, that's a great word. Beyond great and bad. <laughs> beyond awesome and sucky. Yeah. That was probably his original title, actually. And then, like, his girlfriend was like, check out this thesaurus, dude. What about good and evil, hmm? Mm. Yeah. I just don't think... That the original title would have had the punchiness. So good job, Thesaurus. Anyway, uh, I think the answer is pretty simple on this one. You have to read a lot. Oh, you know what? And, then, and use the big very, words. Very first three words I was going to say is read a lot. Yeah. Literally, that's the answer. It's I use it for foreign language vocabulary, and it inevitably works for your native tongue as well. I mean, the only way you remember words if you don't force it with like spaced repetition systems or something is if you get to see them a lot in real context. And if you really like a word, maybe try using it in conversation a few times and you'll almost certainly remember it a lot better after that. Yeah. But that's basically it. One warning though, don't don't use a bunch of antiquated or academic words where they don't sound naturally. You you can counterintuitively sound less intelligent if you use a bunch of really long words for no reason. Oh yeah. There's like a really so, good quote about so that. So don't do that. I didn't I didn't think we should title this episode How to Aggrandize Your Vocabulary because that would have been pompous and nobody would have known what it meant and it would have been dumb. Um, yeah. A side note, if you do want to learn a bunch of weird pompous old words, uh, The Horologicon is a book by Mark Forsyth and he wrote The Etymologicon, a book on etymology I really liked. So it's about a bunch of really antiquated English words. So yeah. that's probably fun. But I wouldn't use them in conversation probably. Yeah, there's actually a lot of quotes. There's oh, what? There's one that I really like, but I can't find it right now. Cicero said, when you wish to instruct, be brief. Every word that is unnecessary only pours over the side of a brimming mind. Yeah, there's a lot of really good ones. But basically, people really do value the ability in someone to communicate an idea in simple terms. Yeah, you at least you need to be speaking to your audience mm -hmm. and knowing the vocabulary your audience is probably listening for. If yeah. you're in a room filled with engineers, you can talk about fancy engineer stuff. But if you're talking to me about some fancy engineering stuff that I don't know, you shouldn't use terms I'm not going to understand and not at least try to simplify them a little bit or give me a cool analogy or something. Yeah. So with that in mind, I think most people spend a lot of their time hanging out with friends talking at normal levels and if you try to basically like cut your teeth on these new words with your friends you're just going to come up with something really weird <laughs> yeah They're so probably gonna make fun of you for it <laughs> number one read a lot and don't just like read a lot of really easy books that are within your comfort circle or comfort zone branch out and pick things that seem interesting and a little bit difficult you know i just read a book on bayesian statistics the other day like there not the other day uh, a couple months ago i don't know why i said the other day because my vocabulary is bad. Yeah. I'm reading a book on war strategies right now. I just read Deep Work. You know, I like to gravitate to all sorts of different topics, and that does help me build my vocabulary. But I also think that aside from reading, you have to be able to use it. 
And you have to be able to basically like throw yourself into battle and give yourself a necessity to use these words. So if you really want to expand your vocabulary, find an online community that pushes you to write in a more complex way. It could be some sort of like debate forum, you know, like a really oh, yeah. intelligent debate, debate de- forum. See, I was considering debate, but I was scared people would end up doing some political Facebook comments. That's not the same thing. <laughs> I don't that's, think that's you can the same use kind of debate. You're not allowed to use big words yeah. in political Facebook comments yeah. because Go your somewhere. grandma's going to be like, where'd you learn that? Your, your commie liberal yeah. private yeah. school. I'm glad you could Google big words. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a real debate. Go somewhere where you can have real debates. Yeah. Or like, so um, the comments on the articles at less wrong it's like an entire oh, website yeah. devoted to rationality. It's it was the it was started by the guy who wrote Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. So that's why I read a lot of the articles there. And actually, I think you can even submit articles to that site. And there's a lot of really nerdy people there. So there's any number of maybe really a, nerdy places an online. Specific subreddit of like a linguistic subreddit or something. Probably yeah, can something listen like to that. linguistics words. Or the the subreddit change my view. You Ooh, know, that's a good one. I any like place one. where people are discussing complicated topics is a good place to stretch your vocabulary. Also, my girlfriend does online role plays and actually she runs one as well, where basically it's like instead of writing fiction yourself, you get with a bunch of people and you essentially trade back and forth writing parts for a character or writing stories together. And I would imagine that's another really great way to bolster your vocabulary yeah she can use literary words that would sound really dumb in conversation but sound cool in like some sort of fantasy or steampunk or whatever setting yeah yeah exactly oh yeah there you go challenge yourself to write in a victorian setting yeah or something like that or challenge yourself to write in ancient rome or something like that yeah just i think you really have to give yourself a challenge find some opportunity and put yourself into an arena where you really do have to use these words to maximum effect not just superfluously Ooh. to use a big word Ooh, look at Tom <laughs> look over here can Google words. Big words. hey you didn't hear any typing that's the beauty of he, this show he googled it with his mind uh, i could have done it with my phone that would be very clandestine Ooh, there's another one zing uh, that is the beauty of having mm. two mics in the same room you always know what i'm typing yeah and we make no attempt to cut it out because it would be impossible and i just i like hearing typing in shows yeah. i don't know about you but it's fun <laughs> anyway so um this last philosopher you're gonna be scared because uh this is augustine of hippo oh no otherwise known as saint augustine but i like this name better he's one because... of the most dangerous mammals in the world yep he is i don't even know what a lot of these words mean diocese diocese i don't know either Uh-oh. i know what i know what appointed and installed and term ended mean but i don't know what diocese means i don't know it looks like i need to build my vocabulary oh uh, here we go a district under the pastoral care of a bishop in the Christian church. See, Boom. I'm not that New word. In that Unlock. Topic, so there you go. Well, why don't you go learn about the papacy, dude? All right. I'll work on that. You going to become the Pope? I will become the Pope. Cool. Well, while you're you working know. on that, St. Augustine has a question. And his question is, I was doing my homework and I got stuck <laughs> on a problem. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Philosophy homework. <laughs> it started to make me really frustrated. So I tried moving on to something else. And my frustration with the problem got worse and worse to the point where I just gave up on the entire day and never finished my to-do list. So I was just wondering if you've ever had an experience like this, and if so, how do you deal with it? So how do you deal with a problem that frustrates you and basically mentally shuts you down and makes you want to do nothing else for the entire day? Uh, I mean, I deal with this all the time. Yeah. It's, it's usually not in the realm of I can't solve a problem it's usually in the realm of I feel completely overwhelmed and undermotivated to fi- to fix something or to finish something. Usually when it's like a giant video editing project. Because as I told a friend of mine yesterday, I am at every step of the way in, in the making of a video, my worst enemy. Because I'll take a, a topic and when I take the idea of a topic at the outset, I think to myself, I don't have anything to say on this. So I'll over-research it, which makes me take forever. And then because of my over-research, I will make a script that is far too long. And then I'll end up with like a nine minute video where I was shooting for a five or six minute video in the first place. And then not content to let a lot of it just be me talking, I will have like a hundred ideas for graphics and animations, even if I have barely any time to get it done. And that's when the frustration sets in. 
because now I've kind of committed to myself to all these animations and I like all these ideas and I don't want to kill my darlings as uh, Hemingway would say or Stephen Hawking or not Hawking um, Stephen King would say why wow. Hemingway might have said that too and then I just realized like oh, I have to make all these things and that is like the thing that will usually shut my brain down so I don't know yeah well I used to have this problem when I was uh, back in math class actually you know in school mm. and one of the things that I would do to make sure I didn't ruin the rest of the day was if it's not too bad I can usually take a break and come back to it and then work on it. But if it's really bad and you're just shut down, is it absolutely needed now? Can mm. you push it off to tomorrow? Just say, I need to sleep on this one problem. It's tomorrow now, and I'm going to do the rest of the things on today's checklist. That way, I pushed off one thing and not ten, which yeah. is a much better solution, really. Mm -hmm. As long as you have the time. Usually what I do is go for walks. Yeah. You know? And for those of you who watched the video, I said do that as part of your breaks. Going for a walk always clears my head, always um, helps me. Changing location? Changing location helps. But I mean, so before we recorded this podcast, I was sitting there trying to edit my video and I just hit a brick wall. I was like mentally fried. And the, the thought of sitting there and trying to work for any more time was the worst. So I left and I went on a walk, even though it's very cold and I don't have a cool hat yet. I did it. And now I feel fine. Yeah. So do that. I do want to give you a couple for anybody who has a problem with this, a couple of, I don't know if they're, they're tips, but they're reassurances. So number one, like you said, sh you, you should probably step away from the problem for a while, come back the next day. But this isn't a good idea simply because it's going to help you get over your frustration and cool down a bit. It's also literally going to help you solve the problem. Because what you're doing is you're using distributed practice or spaced repetition. By stepping away from your problem, you give yourself some space from it. And you allow your mind's diffused mode, which is much more subconscious, to start working on the problem in the back, even if you don't realize that it's happening. And who knows, you might hit a breakthrough while you're in the shower or while you're at the gym or something or when you're going to bed. But either way, there's a higher likelihood that the next time you come back to that problem with a fresh mind and having been away from it for a while, you're going to be able to solve it and you're going to be able to see things that you didn't see the first time. When you're frustrated, when you're stressed, it actually prevents your brain from making connections at a biological level because your brain releases different chemicals and they are uh, antagonistic to your ability to think clearly. This is why test anxiety is also a, an actual blocker to you being able to remember facts on tests. So if you can step away, de-stress, you're not only going to enlist that diffused mode, make connections due to space repetition, but you're also going to get rid of all the stress chemicals that block conclusions from being made. And I thought there was another justification for stepping away, but I may have said them both in one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the whole subconscious thing, that makes a lot of sense. How many times are you looking for a word and you're like, I can't think of this. It's on the tip of my tongue. You forget about the topic entirely. And then like eight hours later, you're just like, oh, it was that word, even though you weren't thinking about it. It just came. Your brain was searching. It was yeah. doing some searching that whole time. Yeah, exactly. So St. Augustine, step away from your problems, dude. All those, I don't know, things you're writing. They yeah. can wait. I don't know what he wrote. I don't know what he's doing. That's I mean, something cool, when probably. you're like wrestling with the origins of the universe and I don't know, whatever, whatever things he's writing, man, I don't know. I don't even know this much about this guy. Yeah, I don't know. I just picked it because he had hippo in the name. Yep. <laughs> uh, I feel like I feel like he was Catholic, but I can't remember. Maybe not. Maybe the, this is the thing that we get a bunch of angry comments about because I'm going to be. Maybe he was like the most. What if he was like this? some really crazy controversial figure, and and we just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's controversy about him. He is viewed as one of the most important church fathers in Western Christianity. Oh, I know why it doesn't say whether or not he was Catholic because he was born in 354. Oh, which was quite a bit before oh. the Catholic and Protestant split. Uh, yeah, he was. I think the Roman Empire may have still been around. When he was alive, like the the whole Roman Empire, potentially. Anywho, that does it for our questions. We have helped out some dead philosophers today. Yep. I think that's our accomplishment for the day. <laughs> and if you guys want to see the show notes for this episode, and if you 
don't happen to live in 354 AD or whenever Confucius lived and you do have internet access, then cigpodcast.com slash 136 is where you can point your web browser to see all of those resource links and also links for rating and reviewing the podcast on iTunes. If you want to be a super awesome person, I should probably get better vocabulary words for that <laughs> and support the show. We'll get a thesaurus. We'll get a thesaurus. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to be a wonderful person and support the show ratings and reviews and uh, also subscribing to the show if you have not already done so all that helps to bump the show up the rankings and basically show more people that the show exists so thank you if you do that and beyond that i think that about wraps up this week's episode of the podcast so until next week stay cute guys Thank you.